and we'll take a, let it roll. So the Passive House standard is the world's most efficient building envelope efficiency standard. So the goal is to, um, and when you build to the Passive House standard, you're getting a building that's about, um, saving about 90% of the energy that would be in your normal code compliant building. So over here, you've got a code compliant building. As you improve the efficiency, the heating energy uh, cost is dropping, but the upfront construction costs are climbing exponentially. And so most people don't go much beyond this, but there's a point out here where um, you reach the passive house standard and you can drop out the furnace. And so that is considered to be a point that um, you can achieve real energy savings. And at that point, you're getting the total cost dropping back down into the range of what, not too much more than conventional construction. So that's uh, what they were trying to do with the passive house standard is you know, push that uh, efficiency to the maximum with super insulation and air tightness, and you'll be able to um, take the buildings to the next level. And actually, if you look at what we need to do to avert climate change, it's pretty much about the range of 90 percent uh, energy efficiency or uh, energy consumption reduction. So this is comparing a code compliant building here in Michigan and passive house standard. So um, the peak demand in a passive house building is about one watt per square foot as opposed to 14 watts per square foot. The annual heating, we've got like 1.4 kilowatt hours as opposed to 3.6 kilowatt hours. Um, annual energy production 11.2 is compared to 56.6. Um, and primary energy is when you measure your, your energy consumption at the source, the power plant or the gas well. Um, air leakage is a maximum of 0.6 air changes per hour. And the code is allowing you seven air changes per hour. So you can actually have a building that's losing all the air in it seven times in the current code. Um, this is uh, the 0.6 air changes per hour. Um, this is during a blower door test, both of those. So the roof is um, R R60 or better. Uh, the ducts um, are drop in size from being like this big down to three, three inch. And since they're inside, they don't have to be insulated anymore. Um, the walls are around an R60 total. And the window, um, is uh, R7.2 minimum, uh, ours are like an R9, which is pretty close to the performance of a regular two by four wall um, that's insulated. And uh, then the floors, I also figured is an R60. And because uh, in this condition we have a crawl space that's unconditioned, the um, uh, low grade insulation is, is the same in both of these examples. Now. Um, here is uh, the first project. It's an addition on the north side of a building in Ann Arbor. That's the owner. He's a, an owner builder. What his energy goal was was to double the size of his house and keep the same energy bill. So the first thing you have to do is look at wh uh, what your solar window is if you're trying for passive house standard. And um, he had a lot of shading. Here, uh, he ended up taking off an older addition on the back of his house that was too, uh, wasn't built to code and was too weak to support the new stuff. And then he rebuilt a uh, kitchen bathroom on the first floor and a master bedroom and bath. And then on the third floor is a loft. And the loft is really the first place that he gets any solar gain into the, this addition. So it couldn't really become a passive house addition um, separate from the house because up here is the only place that, that they get uh, access to the sunshine for this new addition. Um, the new basement goes down deeper than the existing basement and it's designed so that uh, if they want to take it all the way to the passive house they can insulate the floor between these two and have this be an unconditioned basement. But right now that's the place where the kids play all the time. Um, so here's that basement level. And because they went deeper, we had to um, extend a shelf out here to protect the foundations so we wouldn't undermine those foundations. Up here, we uh, insulated up 
up in the band joist area and also did air sealing up there. And those block walls actually have insulation on the outside about three inches. Um, so we uh, actually built this as two separate buildings with what's called an expansion joint. It's, it's like two walls right next together, uh, the party wall, and there's an expansion joint all the way up so that the new building isn't putting forces on the old building. And we're going to look at this detail up here. Uh, we'll show you um, how we're thinking about the building. We're always trying to get a continuous air barrier in a passive house so that um, you're not losing a lot of heating and heated air out, and you're also not having the heated air carry moisture um, out into your building envelope, which can cause the building to deteriorate uh, much faster than it should and can also make sick building syndrome that makes so many people ill. So here is that detail. We've got um, basically a two by six wall framed here, and then there's plywood sheathing that gets taped. And um, the, that air barrier is continuous on up, and uh, it, it also gets taped back to the windows down here. So that's, um, we're always trying to, to make that uh, very um, airtight, the whole building. It's like building a balloon out of sticks is what we're up to. Um, in this case, most of his walls, this part here is about a foot thick. We went for a higher insulation R value there because the south wall, um, there's a chimney right out here looking out, uh, existing chimney out that way, looking out the south windows, and we couldn't get that close to it, so we had to use a higher R value. So right here you can see the air barrier in uh, that piece of plywood, and this gets taped back to the window so it's uh, completely airtight. And then um, this is a window on the east and west. So whereas the south windows, we push the windows all the way out. On the east and west sides, we actually pull them halfway back in so that the window depth helps to shade things. This is a Larson truss. So you can take two smaller pieces of member, two smaller pieces of wood, and join them together with plywood to make a deeper framing member. And that's what frames the outside of the house. Um, Here's the party wall joint, that expansion joint that I told you about. And uh, we uh, use sealant um, on all sides of that to make sure that that's watertight. Um, here th we've got that deep window where we're pulling the windows on the east and west back into the wall and we're making a sill pan, pan here where the uh, material goes up behind the siding so that that's all flashed watertight. Um, and this is, uh, this is a north window that's actually flush with the outside of the building, but because we flared the sides of the opening, it gives you the feeling of a bay window without the heat loss of a bay window. And uh, this is the kitchen area. Um, it becomes very important when you have a really super insulated building to use highly efficient appliances that aren't going give, to give you overheating problems in the summer. Um, here, the party walls come together. And in the doorway there, you would see an expansion joint, but it's not very noticeable. This is a bathroom under the stairs in the addition. Um, the windows are all casement or awnings. You can't do a passive house with sliding windows like double hungs. Um, the stairs going up to the master bedroom from the kitchen area. And this is the third floor loft. And this was in, originally intended to be the parent's study, but because it's the sunniest, nicest, warmest space in the house, that's where the kids want to hang out. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, the bathroom here. You, uh, there will also be an expansion joint here alongside the tub. Now this is their energy bills, and you have this information on your handout. Uh, the yellow here is the house as it was before they got it then the existing house, then they insulated the existing house as the red bill, bills, and then the green bills on the very top is after the passive house addition. Up here is the cost that they had, $92 a square foot. Um, if you look here at this graph, this is graphing those utility bills, it looks like all three lines are the same, but you have to remember that the, the uh, green section, we actually doubled the square footage, so these graphs show you cost per uh, energy cost per versus the square footage, the volume, 
and the surface area. And you can see that with the addition, um, they've basically halved the amount of energy consumption. So they did achieve their goal of being able to get twice the building with the same energy costs. And they have more room to go here because if they took it to the passive house level, they could put in a heat recovery ventilator and stop losing uh, heat through infiltration, air leakage. Um, they could tighten up the existing building, put in more insulation, separate the condition spaces from the basements that aren't insulated. Um, so there's a lot of more energy savings they can go after, but at least when they did this addition, it's not making it harder for them to get to the passive house standard in the future. And that was kind of our goal for them. So, and then the next slide's gonna go through um, what would be involved in retrofitting to the passive house standard. So the first thing you would do, um, cutting the eaves off, and then you patch those, um, wrap the building with OSB and tape to make that air barrier. Um, you can uh, eliminate the plumbing stack and put in air admittance valves. Chimneys get eliminated. You can use condensing dryers, and if you have to have a furnace, you can use a condensing furnace. Um, so passive house compliant windows, uh, new siding. Um, we're going to be uh, spray sealing at the sill plates and um, the, uh, all of your mechanicals are going to move out of the basement area and up into the building, but since they're so much smaller, they can go into spaces that were formerly attic spaces um, and you lose a lot less heat and you have a building that you don't have to worry about it freezing in the winter time. If you go away, left it in the middle of the winter all by itself, you come back and it'll still be in great shape. <laughs> Okay, project library. So that was my client's project in an urban site. This is my house, west edge of Washtenaw County. Um, okay. So ours, we're doing a lot of uh, really wild and crazy building technologies that aren't necessarily passive house standard, but it's kind of a demonstration project for us. Um, this is where it was about a year ago. So we don't need a furnace. Our basement walls are about R60. Uh, the floor is an R45. Upper walls. Um, are 55 and the roof was 132, but that's because we changed uh, horses midstream. I'll tell you more about that. The windows were 9.5, super airtight at uh, 0.6 air changes per hour. No plumbing stack, no flush toilet, um, composting toilet used. Uh, the dryer is actually part of the ventilation system and um, Solar hot water evacuated tubes will be providing seasonal heat storage for us. Um, and uh, then we'll have a solar system as well and LED lighting. So, okay, so, so this is a uh, section through our house. I'm sorry the proportions are distorted here. Um, so the existing contour of the land was going up like this. And we've got uh, about 14 feet of earth here on the south side. That's what my husband is showing there with his, with a the rod there to show you how deep the excavation was. Um, so we've split, instead of having your unconditioned space and then your living space stacked vertically here, we've got the unconditioned space on the left-hand side and the conditioned space of the house on this side. This is root cellars that have concrete block walls like this. And then they are both, that's getting coated with the same material that our foam walls are getting coated with. So most of the rest of the house is built with foam coated with glass fiber reinforced concrete. On the upper floor, we enter through the greenhouse that's also an unconditioned space and we've got some storage up there as well. Um, and then here we're um, shooting some gravel into the formwork here. The, the perimeter is, um, uh, drainage for water, as well as uh, removing rain on, radon gases. Um, that slab is the structural slab for the building. 
Here we're cutting 12 inch pieces of foam to go in the floor. You can see some of the white foam there in the floor. The blue foam is high load foam, 100 pounds per square inch, used in airport runways. Um, here we've put PEX tubing on top of the foam insulation for the floor, and we've coated it with glass fiber reinforced concrete. And that uh, little structure there was um, a rainwater cistern that was our first um, experiment with building with the glass fiber reinforced concrete. We started putting the foam walls around the perimeter. And that's completed. We've got the door, first door buck in place. Here's the cistern that I mentioned. So that cistern is the same kind of construction that was our practice structure. Um, here's uh, the plumbing set into the ground floor. So this could have a shower. Um, this is a, an air admittance valve. So instead of having a plumbing stack up through the building, the air admittance valve lets air into the plumbing so that the water will go down properly. Um, that was the PEX tubing, it was where the manifold would go. Uh, this is the top of the basement level, and this is a um, ejector pump in a, in a sump for dealing with the wastewater in the, in the basement level. Um, so we've got concrete locking that door buck into place. And this is the nozzle of the spray equipment. Sometimes we have to clean that out when we're working. Uh, this was my anniversary gift one year. Every woman should have her own personal uh, foam cutting device. It curved the window edges there. Uh, so uh, we're gluing the window bucks in place. Up here we've got um, cavities for the ends of the I-beams to go in there and get locked into place. This is for the electrical, so the conduit's going to go in here. Um, and there's a diagonal groove for the drainage plane here. So uh, we have a layer of air all the way around our building. That's what this horizontal strip is. But, um, so we, uh, there's always a way for the water to get down to the drainage system. Um, this is the electrical boxes going in, foamed in place, foam over top, and concrete over that. Um, so there's more, more of those beam pockets that are built into the top of the wall there, and the, the wood joists will go into that. This is our mixer um, and pump. Here we've got uh, a groove in the foam panel here that the, that the uh, floors were inserted into. This is the compost toilet arriving. Um, and our first snow of the year. So we basically had a bathtub this first year, and we put, put some of the foam panels over it temporarily to try to keep the water out of it through the winter. Uh, this was all filled with hay through the winter, trying to keep the foundations from freezing. More of the hay and tarps over the building. Um, Christmas, the first year. So we started in July that year, so we got off to a slow start. Uh, my mother, who's now about 80 years old, is uh, enjoying helping us build there. Um, she's, uh, th this is our window buck, so we have screws in the edges of the window buck that allows the concrete to lock into it, and then the window would sit in that opening and get finished with trim. So she's uh, it's sitting on barrels there. but um, So we've got... Uh, some of the foam panels here are getting inserted into that ledger cut that I made. And uh, this gives you an idea of the scale of those panels. They're 16 feet long, 4 feet wide. Here I'm cutting one of those ledgers. It's a rip cut that's 8 feet long and 3-sided. So you can do some amazing things with foam hot wire cutters. Um, this is the concrete block wall. It had some weeps in the bottom to make sure it could all drain to the outside. Um, and now we're starting to build up the tiers uh, in the root cellar because we want the cold temperatures from the ground to come in through the root cellar. Uh, we've grouted every third core with a rebar there. And then when we get it all built up, it gets coated with the same glass fiber reinforced concrete that we put on the foam. So this is the foam walls with uh, the doorway, basement doors put into place. Um, this is the last tier of the block uh, is going into place there, and the roof's completed. 
Um, so now we're ready to coat the inside. We've got all the foam interior walls in place, and uh, here we're delivering concrete through a hose to the, the floor over top of those root cellars. Um, so the concrete here locks the foam walls down to the ground, to the slab, and we're setting up here for another spray day with um, the pumps and mixers. Uh, we did a little tilt-up panel here where we pre-coated it and then set it up. Um, this is the, the floor, first floor level um, getting coated with the first co coat of concrete. And it's amazingly strong. I've got a sample out there. You can test it yourself if you want. <laughs> uh, the foam, uh, there's um, We've got a V-groove here. This is where the drainage plane will get tashed, so that's wh how high the ground will come on the building. Here we're uh, plastering the building with some of the glass fiber reinforced concrete and stirring the concrete in the hopper to make sure there's no air bubbles in the hopper that uh, would cause problems. Um, I found that uh, just compressing it by hand often uh, does as well. Um, here's the spray applying because um, you really want to make sure you get all the bubbles out. If you, there'll be some pictures later, you'll see uh, what happens if you leave those bubbles in there. This is the mixer, high-speed mixer. It's almost like an immersion blender. <laughs> this is a peristaltic pump, so it's actually squeezing the hose to push the concrete through rather than having a centrifugal pump. And here he's applying it on the deck, and we're troweling it smooth. Okay. It looks really distorted to me. Um, this is all compressed this way. Uh, so we've gotten um, the second coat on that, and it's pretty well ready for next winter. Uh, the basement doors are finished and anchored in place. Um, we're setting up for, uh, we just uh, took the foam slabs off that were on there for the winter and getting ready to put up more foam. Um, so here's the second tier and the windows going in, the window bucks going in. Um, and in this case, uh, we finished that corner and that was about the time my husband decided he wanted this window over here. So we're cutting around it with the, uh, through the concrete on both sides and we take the hot wire cutter and follow that through the foam. And then we just took this panel and put it, <laughs> put it over there and <laughs> swapped them around and voila, <laughs> back together. So uh, and then we finished the top of the wall here, more bean pockets. Um, we poured a, a slab over top of that foam to get it nice and level and easy to work with. Uh, here's um, piers that are going to be serving for the bracing for our PV system that we poured. Now, at this point, we're, we were getting too close to winter and we needed some help, so we hired a spray crew for about 10 days to come in and help us finish applying all this concrete and mix. So that's what they're doing. That's, that's the amount of sand and concrete that's anticipated they're going to use in those 10 days. <laughs> and uh, this is another place where the drainage plane will be anchored. Um, so I've got some barrels underneath there trying to get the flat roof to drain um, as it's drying. These are buttress walls. I wasn't sure how much earth forces we had, so I put those in, but we might not have needed those. He's plastering the ceiling there. This is the crew. It was about six people on the crew every day, and uh, they had their own pumps and mixers that they preferred. So, um, And the boss is in the red shirt there getting together. That's his magic elixir. It's proprietary. He won't even sell it to people for um, patching up the, the uh, if you need to patch an area. Uh, he's the only one, his teams are the only one that's allowed to apply um, his proprietary mix. So uh, there they are spraying it on the wall around the beam pockets. We pre-coated the beam pockets because it was easier to do that um, with it laying flat. On a, on a table before we put the walls in place. And this, this fellow on the left-hand side there, he's, he's a professional plaster from uh, Romania and uh, is, is really 
quite skilled and fast at the work. Um, did an act, he, he did excellent work. I wish I could say the same of all the rest of the people on the team, but uh, so. Uh, we're just, uh, this was the last day, and we're just trying to finish up all the parts that got missed. This was one of the places that got missed. The hose wouldn't reach all the way around, so they had to do that section by hand. Um, so this is the reinforcing that goes inside one of those sauna tubes for the concrete piers. Uh, here we're attaching interior bearing walls to the little buttress walls that I put in place. And uh, this is the stairwell for the building. Uh, we're patching an eye joist that came to us damaged so that uh, we could still use it and it wouldn't hold up the project. We attach these eye joists by putting screws in the top and sometimes the bottoms and then the concrete gets packed in around those screws to lock it into the wall. So that's just a panorama of the basement level there. This is our office in the basement. Um, with the new so the guys that uh, we hired to come in, they were really sloppy. It's a good thing we had tar paper down on the floor because they just dropped buckets of concrete and I had to chisel that off. <laughs> um, th this is a temporary uh, roof going up over the, the new floor that we've got into place. Um, and we're taking the, the foam and putting it over the building and gonna re-tarp it um, for the winter time. And uh, so that done with tarping for the winter there. And then we're just about ready to start with our backfilling. That's the second winter. Oh, th these guys are spraying an asphaltic uh, waterproofing compound on the walls. Uh, and then the drainage plane, which is this black material, has uh, like deformations in it that keeps an airspace next to the wall. So between the waterproofing and the drainage plane, which the gravel connects it to the foundation drains. Um, we don't expect and we haven't had problems with uh, water coming in through that basement level. So this is a radon mitigation pipe that's connected up to the foundation drain. So if we discover we've got radon problems, we can just put a fan on that and be able to get rid of the radon. So, okay. so. Here we're uh, putting a geotextile down over the gravel to keep the dirt out of it. And um, then we had piers poured for the columns for our PV array on the south side. Um, the drainage plane wrapping around. This is where the, the earth will be. The earth will be coming down on, along those lines there. Um, again, covering the gravel and putting the drainage plane into place. Um, and uh, here we're, they're going to be uh, removing this hay. Uh, but for, they had to break for Christmas. This is the second Christmas. So we only had about half of the foundations backfilled at Christmas time. And we uh, continued to work on putting the drainage plane up on the other sides. And then they came back after Christmas to finish. So. This is PEX tubing. It's being laid in the foundation around the building uh, with the intent that, uh, the, and here's where it's going to come into the building. So we need to seal this, this seam. That's how, how it gets sealed in the drainage plane. Um, the PEX tubing will be uh, picking up ground temperatures. This is the tube from the uh, cistern over there. And the ground temperatures get picked up in the, in the PEX tubing and then that uh, cooler, the, the ground temperature water is used to temper the incoming air. So it's like uh, free dehydration in the, in the uh, summertime and free fr uh, frost prevention of the HRV core in the wintertime. So these guys are, are working on the backfill. And this fellow over here is actually mining some sand out of our site to use um, to bed the PEX tubing in so that it uh, doesn't get damaged. So. Here he's clearing away the last of that hay from the previous year um, so that he can backfill with dirt around the building. Uh, and you can see the drainage plane is now fully installed on this side. 
Um, so here's the beds of sand with the PEX tubing laid out to the east. And the next side you'll see we laid it out to the west. And then we'll do it again east and west with about a foot of sand between each layer. Um, so we had four tubes that uh, go around the foundations and pick up those ground temperatures and go to the inside of the building. Um, so instead of having to run a heat pump, that can, you can just move the energy with a tiny little uh, hydraulic or hydronic uh, pump. So here they're uh, backfilling. This fellow is bringing the soil from the little mountain where they stockpiled it earlier. And then the mini reaches over and grabs it and puts it where it needs to go around the foundations. So. This guy is so good with that equipment. It's tight space there, but he whips that thing around like it, uh, it's so fast it makes my head spin. Um, the first year we had terrible problems with the settling. The soil was up there right at the door level, and then it dropped down, and we had a moat. <laughs> and I was out there in the wintertime uh, hammering through ice trying to get drainage channels. That's what this uh, bridge there is. I, I needed a pathway out there so I could work on drainage. Um, that was not fun. Uh, OK, just pictures of our interior here. This, the stairwell up to the next level happens there. And um, then this, this is like a bathroom area on the ground floor that doesn't need light, um, a mechanical space in this room. Um, and the eye joists there over uh, some central bearing walls. This is the plumbing. Uh, waste lines to the outside, and they're actually a little, well, we, um, this is from the ejector pump. It's smaller than you would usually see for wastewater because there's no flush toilet. It's, we're using composting toilets. So that's where the ejector pump is, and that pipe will take it up. Um, so we turned our, our bridges into ramps here. And uh, here we uh, got some salvage cabinets and stashed them up with our panel lifter into the uh, roof of the barn. Um, here we're finishing the plaster ceiling over the place where the tanks are. And here I'm making a diagonal rip cut, the whole length of the piece of foam. Um, and cleaning up the foam so it's ready to take concrete. I can fix uh, problems. If, if it makes a little hiccup when I'm cutting, I can cut a piece off, glue it on. So I, there's quite a bit of uh, flexibility if you make a mistake. Um, so again, cutting pieces for the roof. Um, my husband just put the plumbing in, and he's photographing what he's got done there. The, and uh, we're putting some of the foam back into the, <laughs> into, or taking the foam out of storage, sorry. So we're uh, taking those large pieces of foam out of storage so we can use them. Um, so this is where the heat recovery ventilator is going to go, those two pipes, one for incoming, one for, and this is my anniversary present, um, curving the foam so that uh, I have much nicer um, light gradient at the windows in the basement level. Some more of the buttress panels prepped to go into the building. Um, so we have panels mounted to the walls wherever we need to hang equipment. Uh, they, they're on embeds that are set into the concrete. And uh, here, again, we're gonna, we've got screws in the eye joists, and we're going to pack that with uh, concrete to lock the eye joists into the wall. So the same thing's happening here. So those buttress walls are going on up through. Um, and I can have them uh, lined up all the way up through the building. Um, <coughs> that's a temporary window with an uh, operable window that we came up with. So it's getting too warm. Um, that's, this is where the heat recovery ventilator is going to work. And that piece of plywood is what they'll hang the, the heat recovery ventilator on. Um, so putting down the floor in the room with the pressure tank. Here we're starting to make a bucket mix of the concrete mixture. So got polyplex and ice and water. 
um, sand is getting added and then mix it with the uh, high shear um, cement mixer. Um, adding some pozolons, those are like the first type of cement that was known to mankind is uh, volcanic cement, so that's a vo fake volcanic cement pozolons. And they're actually stronger than Portland. Um, so mixing the first half of the Portland cement in, and stupid people tricks, <coughs> <laughs> standing on the bucket. Um, it, it, it's, this has very little water in it, this mix, so um, it, it, you re it really can torque on you a lot. Uh, and uh, so when you get the second half of the concrete in, you, you add uh, what's called water reducer, which is like a tiny little ounce of stuff. You put that in, and poof, it goes back to liquid. It's so impressive. <laughs> Here's what happens with the bubbles. That's in the window header there, the crew that did our hurry up quick spraying job. They also didn't uh, make sure the surface was clean. So this was ha we had some dirt that was on the sills uh, and they sprayed it anyways. And that's what happens when you get dirt between the layers. So we actually had to cut that off and fix it. So uh, this is a, a fiberglass mesh. The, all the fiberglass is actually zirconium, not, not regular silica glass but it's um, alkali resistant, which means that it's not gonna deteriorate over the years. Um, this is what happens when you've got uh, rainwater washing down over the wet concrete. <laughs> I have to take that off and fix it. Um, so now we decided to switch to wood because uh, we actually had an issue with, um, it was just too wet this year to, to be able to um, keep working with the concrete system. So we decided to switch to wood because the, uh, we could put the wood up faster. So um, here we're uh, putting down that piece that I was making is a sill plate for attaching the wood. This is going on here. It's got screws in the side. The concrete comes up over the side and holds that, um, that wood plate down as well as the glue there. And that way, um, we'll be able to build on top of the wood here, but it'll be attached to the concrete. It seems to be working pretty good. So the concrete's gonna come up over the edges of this and there'll be screws all the way along that edge. So, so this, um, we just got down the south plate. We're making up some more window bucks. And We've uh, made arrangements for carpenters to come and help us get the wood walls up fast when they come. So um, here we're uh, retarping or untarping. I guess we're just starting to untarp, getting the foam panels uh, set out of our roads so that we can start going up again. We were constantly having to like tarp, untarp because it was just raining so much. We get like maybe three or four days of sunshine. <laughs> um, so uh, taking some of the pre-cut foam panels out, and ready to glue them into place. And um, checking with the water level, we wanted to make sure the, the sills where the uh, wood plates are going are completely flat before we, or where, where the next tiers of foam are going, we wanted that to be flat. Um, this is the bottom of a window there and that's how we uh, glue it down with foam glue and then put the pieces into place. Um, here I'm actually cutting a piece on the site with the hot wire gun. So this, that was the variable power supply. Here I'm notching out a, a three-sided cut with the and also, again, curving the window edges with my anniversary gift. So, so um, putting in the next piece of foam, got the spray glue on, it'll be ready to go in place. Got a window buck in, in place. These are just steak knives that we're using to pin things together. Uh, so, um, getting the, the top piece of foam glued into place. 
Here I'm, I'm trimming the top edge of the wall there with those long uh, aluminum rails as guides and using the water level again. Make sure that this is the top plate that the roof is going to set on, so we wanted to make sure that was going to be completely level and flat. He's pretty tired. That's the, the moon actually here, not the sun. That's the end of a long day. Uh, here's a temporary uh, wood beam that we put in place so that we can put the roof back over it. This, again, we're trying to scramble between uh, sessions of rain. And now we've got an interior space that we can finish uh, laying concrete block and putting the rest of the foam walls up. Um, put temporary plastic in the window openings to keep the weather out. So here I'm reinforcing the uh, tying the top wood plate down to the foam with uh, the fiberglass tape and concrete. So we pretty much just taped the seams before the carpenters came. That was all we really had time for. So we did that inside and outside. And so we still got a lot of bare foam that we have to coat. Um, this is a set of foam stairs coated with the concrete. And those uh, holes were for the bolts that are holding uh, an aluminum channel on the nosing. This was the uh, National Tour of Solar Homes. Uh, had a display of the drawings. So in this picture, again, you can see unconditioned space and conditioned space. And these walls got switched to wood frame construction, but the rest of it is still foam. And the roof is also wood frame construction. So the roof got a lot thicker when we shifted to wood frame construction because instead of having foam walls with no thermal bridging, now we had thermal bridging. And we couldn't make the walls thicker, so it ended up having to get thicker in the roof. And that's three feet deep. <laughs> so this is our uh, water heater. Um, it has about six inches of insulation on it. The uh, window sample that's out there uh, is demonstrating the, the frame there of the window doesn't go all the way through, so there's uh, very little thermal bridging there, only at the corners. And that was our heat recovery ventilator. This is the, the ducts are only about three inches in diameter, very tiny ducts for the rooms. This is, um, can eat, heat an entire house. It's basically like a toaster, uh, um, Toaster oven element <laughs> is about the amount of energy it draws. So um, finish the block walls, and some of these are grouted with uh, concrete, and then we just poured dry concrete down the other cells so that we'd have better thermal transmission. Um, more stupid people tricks. It's full inside and outside. <laughs> uh, here's um, one of the plates. Uh, that's, we're getting ready to put that down on the top of the wall. And just did one here, and the concrete's now holding it on. Um, this is a, a sort of like window buck, but it's um, intended for the uh, greenhouse um, wood-framed wall that's all glass. So that'll, that'll go here on the uh, greenhouse area. We're taking the foam away and stacking it, uh, clearing the floor so the carpenters can begin. Um, so getting ready to, to work with the, uh, the farm up the road was kind enough to provide us with a meal on our big work day before the carpenters came. This is one of the pieces of foam that we're getting ready to, to glue to the top of the wall. So while the carpenters are working, we're still frantically putting up foam walls that they're going to need to attach things to. <laughs> so these are the headers, box beam headers, that um, go over top of the windows on the south wall. And they're framing the, the walls on the floor. And then they'll be able to stand it upright. Um, over there, I was putting in, here, I put in a thermal break along that edge of the wall. They've got uh, walls framed on the floor, tip them upright, kind of like conventional construction, except in this case, the plywood is on the inside um, of the wall surface. And that's our air barrier as well as lateral bracing. So we've got that stood up now. Um, and there's another wall that we did that day. Still working on putting together foam walls for the, the we have to get those up high enough to that the carpenters can uh, build on, on those. So 
Is the second wall section ready to go up? These are uh, framed with eye joists instead of regular studs. As you can see, there's two cords with a plywood web in those. And uh, again, the, the, um, <coughs> the skin that we have is on the inside face of the building, and um, that will get taped. We, we had to fill the space on the end of the eye joists with foam, and we had them tack these things up for a temporary roof, because once again, we're expecting rain, so <laughs> um, we get all these crazy tarp shapes. This under under a temporary roof now with the walls up. And uh, so um, now they're going to get ready and move these walls, take the tarps off and move them to the outside. It's just been pouring rain. We got the tarp off. We're ready to um, start really setting up the walls and be able to do the trusses afterwards, uh, taking off some temporary joists or, or rafters, and then uh, prefabricating more things in the barn while carpenters are at work in other places. Again, a thermal break where the, um, the wood wall is meeting the um, concrete wall. Um, and here he's getting ready, putting the strap on so he can lift the wall section with the sky track. So, okay. And there he's ready to go. These out here are to keep the wall from going too far to the outside when they lift it. So those are temporary braces. They pick it up and set it down. And then they have to anchor it. And so that's what they're doing here is, is uh, tying that wall down. And once they get it all anchored inside and out, then they can take the strap off and move to the next one. So, okay. Um, this was a place where I had the plate going out too far, so we just cut that off after the fact uh, by hand. <laughs> um, and again, you can see the concrete, how that was holding the plate on. Um, getting ready to lift the second wall. Okay, so that, that one will go over here in place. And <coughs> once those walls are up in place, um, after they left, then we have the seams of the walls to, can be taped um, to make that airtight barrier. So the plywood is serving both structurally as well as being the airtight layer in the building. And then there'll be cellulose insulation that'll go into the outside of the wall as well as We'll have insulation in a regular two by four wall on the inside. So there will be two by fours down here <coughs> on the inside that'll hold all the electrical and uh, plumbing and things in the exterior walls. Okay, so we got the south facing exterior wall up. <coughs> and then we had them go straight to trusses. And they were, they had to refigure out how they usually do this because usually they have. Um, the gable walls up first, and then they put the trusses on. So here they had to make up, uh, take two trusses and tie them together so they'd be rigid, um, and use those as a surface that they could lean the other trusses against in order to put them up there. So that's what they're doing there is uh, putting a, a pair of double trusses up there. Then they can lean these other trusses against there and then walk them out. So this is the truss on the east. And then they can start moving the other ones out from that central point. So and here's building a double truss in the yard there while the other folks are working. These are, uh, OK, so that we've got all the trusses on the west side here. Still have some to do this, the last double truss on the east side. And then. Uh, lifting the last set of trusses up into place. Somebody on the ground always has to steer these things with a rope. Getting the sky track over there. Okay. Okay. 
and then he'll lift it up and over on the back side and he'll set it down behind the other trusses. <coughs> and you will see we finally go crawling out there to detach it from the section. So we still have to put in this last end wall here, but we're expecting more bad weather, so we're pushing real hard to get decking on that roof before the bad weather hits. <laughs> Get that off there. You can just feel it up there. You're like, oh. <laughs> so, okay, but they've nearly completed their work. And this was like Friday. Um, got all those trusses into place. And the last thing they did was uh, start us out. Um, with the first row of plywood, but they didn't have time to finish it, so my husband and I did the plywood decking uh, ourselves while they were gone for the weekend. So I'm getting a SkyTrack lesson. I was like really afraid of this machine, but I just ran the plywood up where we could reach it. Basically, that's all I did with it. Uh, so they got the first row of plywood on, and that's all the farther they got, and then my husband and I finished that. Um, and so we still have a little piece here that gets infilled with wood, and more that gets added to the, the foam walls out there to carry more wood. This is, um, we cut through the concrete skin, um, filled it with foam, and then that uh, piece of plastic lumber that was up there um, has screws in the side that uh, let the concrete grab it so that we can attach to the plywood. And this is the jack-o'-lantern at night. Our friend, my friend that was helping me put up the foam, he actually was biking from Ann Arbor uh, like 20 miles on his bicycle <laughs> to come help us. He's an incredible guy. He's uh, older than my husband and my husband's 14 years older than I am, so <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Okay. So here, we, uh, they built the walls on the floor like they'd been doing, and then they have to lift it out through that opening. And uh, here, he's, he's actually got the forks through the window opening and lifting it up and through. Of course, the tarp's trying to tangle it up. <laughs> and then um, it's kind of interesting because this corner is dragging lower, so he's lifting it up and up and up, and then finally he j has to push it against the other wall in order to get it straightened up. And you can hear the whole building go <laughs> But it held, they didn't break it, I was impressed. <laughs> so. right, right about now, he's, he's shoving over there against the south wall to straighten it up. Oh yeah, <laughs> and set it back down in place. I was pretty impressed they pulled that off. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I was going to be filming. They could have, could have watched my building being crushed. So that's the finish when the walls are finished from the inside. Um, and this is the west. They still have that little triangle up there to do. Uh, and we've still got an area here tarped because I showed you that groove we had cut in the floor where the next set of walls go. And we've got fresh concrete on holding down the top plate here. Um, in that area, so, and again, rain, 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 so we finally get to strip that away, and we're finishing off the roof now. Um, we've got the north wall built up. Here, the, we're using eye joists out over this section, um, and there will also be eye joists along here, and this, uh, the framing that's going above the roof is a temporary thing just to support the rafter. Uh, this is on the north side of the building, attaching uh, fascia boards. And there's just stick framing in this section of the wall. One piece at a time, the old-fashioned way. So, I uh, got the roof framed in. And um, these are cedar columns, because this is going to be my husband's greenhouse space with high humidity. Um, 
Here he's cutting off the uh, bottom of the eye joist to make a level soffit. And again, a jack-o'-lantern effect at night. I finally got that enclosed, the greenhouse. Uh, now we're doing a rain screen on the outside of the building. So we'll have um, an air space. This is um, Celotex, which is like paper fibers so that moisture can come out through it. And then there's an air space and then the reflective uh, vapor barrier. Well, it's not a vapor barrier. It's more just a, like a rain screen. Um, this is concrete that's, uh, we had to apply fresh concrete in order to finish the top of the wall, foam wall there so that we'd be able to put the ceilings in place. Um, we've got the roof underlayment on and some of the uh, house wrap. This is where the compost toilet's going to sit, so we had to make a, a level slab, but the bottom of the compost toilet wasn't uh, level itself, so we actually put the toilet uh, on top of that. And uh, that's the incredible snow. So you said one minute? Yeah, yeah, we can just keep it. Okay. The next one. I'll try to okay. So I'll come over here and get ready to. <laughs> so we had definitely had some deep snow, but we've now got the windows in. You can see we had some snow there. The windows are now uh, closed in with plastic, and no more weather coming in. And uh, you miss the credits, but that's not too much. <laughs> so the, the building is uh, all dried in now. Okay. Mm. Thank you. And I'll hang around.